Hello everyone, welcome to Language and Grammar Academy. Thank you for visiting our channel and for checking out our very first video. So our topic for this video is semantics, specifically lexical semantics. Our main reference is Bruce Rowe and Diane Levine's A Concise Introduction to Linguistics. So, let's begin! Semantics is one of the core areas of linguistic theory together with phonetics, phonology, morphology, and syntax. Semantics is the study of the meaning of linguistic expressions such as morphemes, words, phrases, clauses, and sentences. Often, semantics is more narrowly defined as the meaning of expressions divorced from the context in which these utterances are produced and from various characteristics of the sender or receiver of the message. The study of meaning derived from context and features of communicators is called pragmatics. There are two types or general types of semantics. First is lexical semantics, which deals with the meaning of words, and structural semantics, which deals with the meaning of utterances larger than words. We will start with lexical semantics. We can imagine that in each person's brain, there is a lexicon or a dictionary containing the definitions of all the words that a person knows. When a person hears an utterance, that person quickly scans the mental lexicon for the meaning of those words and then interprets them. Similarly, when a person has a concept to express in an utterance, that person scans the mental lexicon for the appropriate words to use in the utterance. But there are different types of meaning that words can have. First of all, words have an actual concrete item or concept or an idea, action, or state of being that the word refers to, its referent. The referential meaning describes the referent. The referential meaning of a word is its definition. In this sentence, your dog is barking. The referent is a particular dog, and the referent of your is a particular person whose dog is being referenced. If you are talking to your neighbor, your is now referring to your neighbor, and the dog refers to the dog owned by your neighbor. However, consider the sentence, a dog is a good pet for a family with children. In this particular sentence, the referent for dog is the concept of a typical dog. So see this image right there. More dogs and then more assorted dogs. The mental image that a typical English speaker has in mind when the word dog is spoken, again, is called the referent. And a particular canine right here is the definition or the referential meaning. Words can also refer to such prevaricated things such as Santa Claus, mermaids, or Mickey Mouse, which do not exist in the real world but which exist as a mental image for English speakers because of their cultural, symbolic representation. So I'm sure that when you hear the word Santa Claus, you think of this guy. And when you hear of the word mermaids, you think of this little girl. And when you hear Mickey Mouse, well, who doesn't know Mickey Mouse? Everybody watches Disney, so you think of this little rat. And of course, there are abstract concepts such as love, truth, and justice. They do not have concrete reference. However, they are meaningful to English speakers because we understand their sense which is an additional meaning beyond referential meaning. We may debate their fine points, but we all have a feeling that we know what they mean. They conjure up a mental image in the mind of the typical English speaker. English speakers understand the meaning of these abstract terms just as they understand terms with concrete reference. Sense is the extended meaning of a word or phrase that in context clarifies the referent. It allows us to understand words that have no concrete reference. Sense also allows us to understand the distinction between phrases that have the same concrete reference. 
In this particular sentence, Dr. Cruz is our resident physician. Both the phrase Dr. Cruz and the phrase our resident physician refer to the same person. This guy right here. Therefore, they have the same concrete referent. But the sense of each phrase is different. Therefore, it's not like saying Dr. Cruz is Dr. Cruz or our resident physician is our resident physician. Sentences like these also illustrate another distinction in semantics, which occurs between reference and meaning. While both of the phrases above have the same referent, they do not have the same meaning. Secondly, there are words that do not have a referent, but instead, it express or they express relationships or characteristics as in the following sentence. He is the teacher of the class. The words he, teacher, and class in this sentence have concrete reference. But what about the words is, the, and of? These are words that have no reference and conjure up no mental image. Their meaning, or rather their usage, tells us about the relationship of one word to another. Consider how the meaning of a sentence changes when the small words change. He is a teacher of class, so this person probably is a role model when it comes to being classy or impeccable when it comes to manners. And then you have, he was the teacher of a class, so I think this sentence is indicating a past tense. He used to be a teacher of a particular class. And you have, he is the teacher of a class. So it's not exactly telling us what particular class or which class. Then the last sentence is, he teacher of class. This one I do not know because the sentence is clearly erroneous. Now, notice how a change, a simple change in those in those sentences or sentences made a big difference when it comes to the meaning of those sentences. Now additionally, what is the meaning of the word he? The personal pronouns such as I, you, he, she, it, and they have concrete reference when they are used in a sentence, but those reference are shifting reference which are different for each speaker and each sentence. The word he in the preceding example has a concrete reference. In the sentence, he is the teacher of the class. But without more information, we don't know what the referent is. Usually, that information is supplied in the sentence uttered or written before the one containing the pronoun. For example, one student might say to another before the semester begins, Are you taking anthropology with Mr. Stein? He is the teacher of the class. Now we know that Mr. Stein is the concrete referent for the word he in this sentence. However, in other sentences, the referent for the word he will not be Mr. Stein anymore, but it could be another man or another boy or maybe it could be Keanu Reeves or this guy right here whose dad is this or maybe this cute little baby or maybe Ji Chang Wu. we don't know okay I hope you're good with reference now so let's proceed to semantic properties of words one of the ways in which the meaning of a word can be analyzed is by determining its semantic properties. These properties are the elements of meaning that make up the mental image of the word in the mind of the speaker. In fact, in the previous paragraph, the words man and boy can be the referent for the pronoun he because all of those words have semantic properties in common. Those semantic properties are maleness and humanness. By analyzing the semantic properties, it becomes clear that the difference between the meanings of the two words is the individual's age or stage of life. The same person will at different times of his life be a boy and a man. The 
Semantic properties of a word are often analyzed by using a system of plus and minus. So this example could be written this way. So if we are to think of semantic properties of the words man and boy, we would come up with the words adult, male, and human. So let's check if they really are semantic properties of man and boy. Now we use the plus and minus. We ask the question, is a man an adult? So we put plus. Is a boy an adult? No, so we put minus. Is a man a male? Yes, so we put plus. Is boy a male? Yes, so definitely a plus. Is a man a human? Yes, so plus. Is a boy a human? Definitely, so it's a plus. Now, this analysis tells us that what makes a man and a boy different from each other is a particular stage or period of human development. So, we can say that adult is not a semantic property possessed by boy. Now, I want you to remember also that there is more to the meaning of words than simply the sum of their semantic properties. In the next lessons, we will discuss various facets of meaning such as denotation, connotation, affective meaning, and social meaning. For the time being, let us also talk about words that have shared semantic properties. Consider the semantic properties of the word tree. It is a plant that is tall, it has a trunk, and is long-lived in comparison to other plants. Now, words that share semantic properties can be considered as a semantic domain. The domain of trees includes such words as oak, maple, ash, birch, pines, and palms. Distinctive feature analysis is the process of breaking the domain into its component parts by using the plus and minus system again. We can determine other words that may belong in this domain. As we look at this analysis, we see that the semantic property that distinguishes pines and palms from the rest of the trees is that they don't have broad leaves. Of course, botanists would find characteristics that distinguish each variety of tree from the larger domain of trees. But most lay people distinguish mainly between those with leaves that fall at one time of year or the deciduous trees and those whose leaves don't fall at one time of year or the evergreen. Markedness is the concept that some members of a semantic domain are more common or usual than others. The members of a semantic domain that are more common are considered less marked. The more uncommon or unusual members of a domain are considered more marked. When you come across the word tree, what kind of tree do you picture in your mind? Most people would think of this tree. Yes, the one that I used to draw when I was in kindergarten. Now, because this is the most common, usual type of tree for most people, we can say that it is the most unmarked meaning of the word tree. Markedness gives us an idea of how the native speakers of a language think about the world. Among the Tiwi, a native Australian ethnic group, the northern cypress pine or Australian blue cypress is so abundant in their traditional homeland and so important in their everyday life that their word for it Karantirikani is not only the unmarked word for tree, but also the unmarked word for plant. English has a bias toward males that is demonstrated by the fact that most often the unmarked simple version of a word has the semantic property of maleness. To designate the female, the word has to be altered. Look at the following words. Lion for lioness. Prince and princess. Actor, actress, poet, poetess, god, goddess, 
hero, heroine. Another way of showing markedness within a domain is with a chart that places the more unmarked terms at the top and the more marked terms at the bottom. This kind of chart allows us to include various distinctions among terms. In the domain of trees, there are trees with broad leaves, needles, or fronds, but there are also fruit trees and flowering trees. Trees with brown bark and those with white bark, those with medicinal properties, those with other useful materials like maple sap. Furthermore, these trees can be broken down into categories that are recognized by scientists as species and subspecies. Notice, as you read the chart, top to bottom, the terms become more marked the farther down you go. The most marked term is the scientific name, which only refers to one species or subspecies. In the domain of color, the most common, most unmarked colors are black, white and the primary colors red, blue, and yellow. But there are also the secondary colors green, orange, and purple. And there are many shades of these colors, powder blue, mint green, hot pink. The more specific terms are the more marked terms. The words in line one are the most unmarked, most general, and most common. The words in line two are more marked, more specific, and more uncommon. And the words in line 3 are the most marked, most specific, and most uncommon in this representation. So, that's the end of our topic for this video. Thank you very much for staying till the end. I'll see you again next time for another lesson here in Language and Grammar Academy. Goodbye!